Okay, hello everyone. Let's see, I uh, posted last week three big posts about uh, the second law of thermodynamics. It's a topic that I've been actually pursuing for no less than 50 years myself. Um, and uh, I think it's a very confused topic. It has a complicated history, a complicated set of things that people have believed, a complicated set of things that people have assumed. I thought in the 1980s that I was on the path to actually being able to really understand what the second law of thermodynamics is about, how general it can be, where its limitations are, and so on. And I think uh, that I finally got to a point where I feel like I really understand those things. And I wrote uh, a big piece about that that uh, uh, posted um, uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do, so as part of my project to understand the second law of thermodynamics, I wanted to kind of make sure that I understood the history of how we managed to get to the place we are today in terms of the sort of common understanding that people have of the second law of thermodynamics. So I, I thought I knew the, sec the history of the second law of thermodynamics, but I knew its broad outlines. And I decided to go in and look in a little bit more detail at how we got to where we are today in terms of the second law of thermodynamics. And so what I wanted to do today was to go through a little bit of the history that I found um, of, of the second law, tell you a bit about that. Uh, on subsequent live streams, I will talk about both my personal history of the sort of 50 years that the arc of, of uh, successive discoveries and, uh, and mistakes and progress and so on that I've made in getting towards what I think is now a good understanding of the second law. And finally, I want to talk about uh, what I've actually think I figured out about the second law and try and describe that, the generalization, the kind of computational foundations of the second law, its generalizations, its limitations, and so on. All right, but today what I want to talk about is how do we get here? What is the history of the second law of thermodynamics? So this is a, a big and complicated story, um, surprisingly complicated story. Let me uh, give you an indication here. I'm just going to uh, this is the post that I wrote, which everybody can find. Um, and uh, the um, um, these are some of the characters that we'll be talking about. There are their signatures, Sadi Kano, William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, Rudolf Clausius, James Clerk Maxwell, Ludwig Boltzmann, and J. Willard Gibbs. Uh, those are some of the characters who were the key uh, contributors to the formation of what is now viewed as the second law of thermodynamics. And this mostly, most of the action was happening in the latter half of the 19th century, uh, the second uh, from about 1850 to around 1900 or so. Um, and uh, uh, it's sort of strange because it was very much tied up with the question of whether molecules existed, which wasn't known really until the beginning of the 20th century. And there's a lot of confusion about whether the second law is something that's about molecules. Once we've established that molecules exist, does that follow that we've proved the second law? These kinds of things. The thing to understand is that in the end, I think the, the reason the second law works as it does has to do with the phenomenon of computational irreducibility, which is a, a very recently understood phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that would not have been accessible in the 19th century. And so when people tried to say, we're going to prove the second law at that time, they just didn't have the wherewithal to do that. And things got quite confused. But then at some moment, people kind of said, well, so much was done and it all relied on molecules. And now we know molecules are real. So therefore, somehow there was the, the, uh, the assumption that, oh, so now the second law has been proved and we can just put it in textbooks and assume that it's sort of a, a thing that is derived mathematically, not just a law of nature derived as other laws of nature are from empirical observation of the world. All right, so let's let's talk about the, the whole history of the second law. So the thing that the, the second law is a law that says that, that uh, um, it's stated in many different forms, entropy tends to increase, uh, mechanical work is dissipated as heat. Uh, heat doesn't spontaneously flow from a hotter body to a colder one. There are a variety of statements. We'll get to where all those statements came from. But before we can really talk about the second law, we have to talk about the nature of heat. Actually, 
pretty quickly after the nature of heat was established, um, the, the, the second law got formulated. So one question is, what is heat? And um, the, uh, the thing that um, uh, that's a, um, um, let's see, did I show you? I, I think I was showing you. Yes, okay. Um, the, uh, I hope I did, I was sharing, I think a little while ago, yes. Um, uh, let me just confirm that. Yes, I, I, I showed you those, those signatures and things, right? Yes. Um, okay, we're going back to the question of what, what is heat? Um, uh, the, um, so the idea of things being hot or cold, that's a matter of uh, kind of basic human perception. And it was realized pretty early that fire might be some kind of disembodied form of heat. So, uh, and in fact, but, but the question of what fire was, was yet another separate question. So Heraclitus, very early kind of philosopher scientist from about 500 BC, um, had this idea, and it was one of the important uh, sort of launching points for, for um, what's become uh, science, that somehow everything is made of fire. Um, now, the concept which was a concept that kind of the, the concept of atomism, that sort of all the diverse things that we see in the world might all be made of a limited number of, of fundamental atomic components. That was an idea that emerged with particularly Democritus, um, a little bit later, um, as uh, as kind of an important kind of thing that means that we really can make a kind of reasoned science out of how the world works. As soon as we know the world is just made from a limited number of kinds of atoms, we just need to know the rules of those atoms. And one might imagine, not knowing about computational irreducibility, for example, that that means one could say everything about how the world works. But in any case, a very early kind of notion of Heraclitus was that somehow everything is ultimately made of fire and also somehow intrinsically in motion. So the uh, uh, the idea that Democritus and the Epicureans in general had was that everything in the world is made up of atoms that move around in the void of space. And they kind of had the idea that turns out to be a correct idea, though it took a couple of thousand years before this idea became widely accepted, that heat has something to do with the motion of atoms. And they particularly imagined that there were some special kinds of atoms. They thought there were maybe five different kinds of atoms in the world, and that there were special spherical atoms, which were fire atoms, that could quickly slide between other atoms that would make up material substances, and that heat was kind of this, this material made of atoms and made of the motion of atoms, that, but they were special kinds of atoms. So that's uh, that's pretty much how things were imagined to be in, in ancient Greek times. Um, a little bit of confusion around the question of, uh, in this kind of assemblage of atoms that made things up, where was the room for souls? And there was kind of a connection made between fire atoms and what made souls, what animated things. Um, and uh, uh, so that was, but but the, this kind of notion of heat, fire, souls, all sort of put together, and, and motion, all sort of put together in ancient Greek times. Okay, so then many things happen in history, but those ideas really don't change um, for a couple of thousand years. And for example, Galileo, 1623, um, is uh, had a had a book called The Assayer which was about uh, it was kind of a, an, an, an annoying and activistic type kind of book, uh, sort of weighing competing world theories. And um, uh, I have a, have a quote here from, from Galileo, uh, it's translated from Italian in this case. Uh, Those materials which produce heat in us and make us feel warmth, which are known by the general name of fire, would then be a multitude of minute particles having certain shapes and moving with certain velocities. Meeting with our bodies, they penetrate by means of their extreme subtlety, and their touch, as felt by us when they pass through our substance, is the sensation we call heat. 
So then he goes on and says, since the presence of fire corpuscles alone does not suffice to excite heat, but their motion is needed also. It seems to me that one may very reasonably say that motion is the cause of heat. That was That's an important statement for what comes later. But I hold it to be silly to accept that proposition in the ordinary way, as if a, a stone or a piece of iron or a stick must heat up when moved. The rubbing together and friction of two hard bodies, either by, by resolving their parts into very subtle flying particles or by opening an exit for the tiny fire corpuscles within, ultimately sets these in motion. And when they meet our bodies and, or, and penetrate them, our conscious mind feels those pleasant or unpleasant sensations, which we have named heat. So essentially, he's drawing a distinction between moving the big object, uh, the, the, the piece of iron or the stick, its collective motion, its kind of mechanical work type motion, and the microscopic motion of the corpuscles that he's describing as being the cause of heat. And he really has that in the end, as we know from sort of more modern physics and science, he has that more or less right. But as we'll see, things get quite confused before we get back to that kind of idea. Um, Galileo also seems to think of heat not just as the motion of generic atoms, but motion associated with some special kinds of atoms. So he says the tenuous material which produces heat is even more subtle than that which causes odor, for the latter cannot leak through a glass container, whereas the material of heat makes its way through any substance. So he's still imagining that heat is made of something, that there is that there are specific kinds of atoms that make heat, but they have the ability to kind of move through different kinds of materials. So lots of people uh, talk about these kinds of things. Francis Bacon, 1620, has his update on Aristotle. Aristotle didn't say much about heat, but um, Francis Bacon in his new organon um, says, um, it's a bit more abstract and obscure, it is not that heat generates motion or that motion generates heat though both are true in certain cases, but that heat itself, its essence and quiddity, is motion and nothing else. So knowing what we know now, we can kind of read backwards onto Bacon and say he understood that heat is a form of motion. But I think what he said was actually kind of more obscure, and I'm not sure that's quite what he meant. But on its face, that's what he said. So the next sort of limiting issue in, in understanding heat was to understand the notion of gases. And air is a prime example of a gas. Um, it really was the, the notion that there was a, a general kind of thing that is a gas was not really a notion that emerged until probably the 1640s or so. Um, and in fact, the, the very word gas was invented by uh, uh, Jan Baptista van Helmont who was a, a Dutch person, um, and um, the, uh, uh, the the word gas, interestingly, he introduced as a word that was a kind of a Dutch rendering of the Greek word chaos, um, which actually meant kind of void or primordial formlessness. So kind of the, the word for gas that was introduced in the, in the uh, 1640s or so was originally a word derived from the word for chaos, word chaos, which was originally meant some kind of formless void in ancient Greek times. Well, when it came to, to gases and so on, um, the one of the statements that have been made, for example, by Aristotle was famous statement, nature abhors a vacuum, was his explanation for why sort of gases flow into things where there is less gas before. Notice that Aristotle had very much a, a kind of a very anthropomorphized notion of nature. Nature wants to do things. It is the purpose of nature to have certain things happen. Something falls towards the center of the earth because that is where it will naturally be, so to speak. It isn't some kind of uh, effort 
to make sort of a mechanistic explanation. It's a more human kind of explanation about what nature is doing. And in this particular case, that nature abhors a vacuum, so tends to have gas kind of flow into a vacuum to fill it up. So by the 1600s, people had sort of were getting beyond Aristotle and trying to make kind of more mechanical and explicit explanations for what happens in the world, rather than just saying, that the world does what it does because that's the way the world wants to be, so to speak. So uh, a figure in that in that whole story was Robert Boyle, um, and uh, uh, curiously, the, the the high school that I went to, Eton, um, was founded in I think 1450 or something, and Robert Boyle also went to that high school. So, and I think for a little while there was a I don't think that high school has produced many uh, distinguished characters, but um, uh, for a while, when there were lists of scientists who'd been there, it um, there was a bit of a gap because Robert Boyle was listed, and then I was listed, and uh, that's a gap of 300 years or so. Uh, maybe that's been filled in in subsequent times by by studying the history more carefully. But I just thought that was a, an amusing feature. But anyway, Robert Boyle, back 1660, is now into doing experiments, which was kind of a new idea. That was a um, uh, the, the notion that you would sort of discover things about the world by experiment rather than by philosophical consideration was something fairly new. Francis Bacon had been much involved in that. I mean, admittedly, some of his reasons for being involved were actually quite political in the sense that he was uh, he was an advisor to Elizabeth I, I guess, and um, had made these statements, you know, if you if you quote it as being from science rather than just being an opinion, people will take it as a as truth. Um, it's sort of interesting to see how that kind of idea plays out over the course of um, uh, 400 years or something. Um, it, it's, uh, but in any case, that that's, um, uh, but Boyle was part of this sort of experimental approach to science. And 1660 published a book called New Experiments, Physico-Mechanical, Touching the Spring of the Air and Its Effects. So by the spring of the air, he meant if you put air in an enclosed in, in something you enclose it in something and you try and push on it it will push back at you it has kind of a spring to it so uh and and he argued that that air has this an, a notion of intrinsic pressure and that it pushes to fill spaces and he effectively found what's now called boyle's law pressure times volume equals constant but the question was that boyle addressed what was air actually made of? Um, and uh, he had two basic hypotheses. He explained them in a very flowery terms. Maybe I'll try and read some of this. Um, uh, let's see. This notion about air may perhaps be somewhat further explained by conceiving the air near the earth to be such a heap of little bodies lying one upon another as may be resembled to a fleece of wool. The spelling is, is a little bit funky here. Wool is spelt W-O-O-L-L, -L, for example. So he's thinking of it as the, 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 the air is made from a heap of little bodies um, as maybe resembled a fleece of wool, wool that's been, been uh, cut from a, from a sheep, for example. For this, to omit other likenesses betwixt them consists of many slender and flexible hairs imagining so that he's thinking talking about the air consists of many slender and flexible hairs each of which may indeed like a little spring be easily bent or rolled up but will also like a spring be still endeavoring to stretch itself out again for though for for though both these hairs and the aerial corpuscles to which we liken them i should say that at that time um the uh uh, the, the notion of an aeriform substance was kind of a, a term for a gas. And so when he says aerial corpuscles, he means somehow atoms of air. Um, and the, anyway, so he says, but for, for though both these hairs and the aerial corpuscles to which we liken them do easily yield to external pressures, yet each of them, by virtue of its structure, is endowed with a power or principle of self-dilatation we now say dilation, by virtue whereof, though the hairs may be uh, 
may be by a, a man's hand be bent and crowded closer together and into a narrow room thus suits best with the nature of the body. Okay, the reason I'm having a hard time reading this is because the the uh, the spelling is all uh, ancient spelling. So these words do not are not spelled in the way that they would be. Uh, many of these words are not spelled the way they would be today. Um, but anyway, so he's saying that um, when you push on the air, as he says, by though the hairs may by a man's hand be bent and, and crowded closer together, um, the uh, uh, they'll 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 sort of you can you can squash them. Yet whilst the compression lasts, there is in the fleece they compose an endeavor outwards. They tend to push out, whereby it continually thrusts against the hand that opposes its expansion. And upon the removal of the external pressure by opening the hand, more or less, the compressed wool does, as it were, spontaneously expand or display itself towards the recovery of its former more loose and free condition till the fleece may have either regained its former dimensions or at least approached them as near as the compressing hand, perchance not quite opened, will permit. So he's imagining you're squashing it, you're letting go, it will push outward, so to speak. This power of self-dilatation is somewhat more conspicuous in a dry sponge compressed than a fleece of wool, but yet we rather choose to employ the latter on this occasion because it is not like a sponge, an entire body, but a number of slender and flexible bodies, loosely complicated, as if the air itself, uh, as as the air itself seems to be. So, in other words, he's saying it's not like a sponge because a sponge is like a you know you can pick up one end and you'll get you'll have the whole sponge. It's rather it's not like you pick up the end of your piece of air and you'll have the whole piece of air. It'll sort of fall apart as all those little pieces of wool would fall apart in a fleece of wool. There is, he says, so this is explanation number one, is air is like a fleece of wool. Explanation number two, there is yet another way to explicate the spring of the air, namely by supposing that with most, by, the, by, by supposing with that most ingenious gentleman, Monsieur Descartes, that the air is nothing but a, a, a congeries or heap of small and for the most part of, very, of flexible particles of several sizes and of all kinds of figures where are raised by heat, especially that of the sun, into that fluid and subtle ethereal body that surrounds the earth, and by the restless agitation of that celestial matter wherein those particles swim and are so whirled around that each corpuscle endeavors to beat off all others coming within that little sphere requ requisite to its motion about its own center. And in case any by intruding into that sphere shall oppose its free rotation to expel or drive it away. Okay, so what he's saying is, so the most ingenious uh, gentleman, Monsieur Descartes, is René Descartes, well-known philosopher, mathematician, scientist, and he's referring to Descartes' idea that the world is made of lots of little vortices in the void. And so he's imagining now that air is made from little things that are whirling around like Descartes' vortices, and that as they whirl around, they beat off other vortices to keep them at a distance, so to speak. So again, uh, you know, qualitatively explained, but rather close to what we now believe is going on in, in the air as molecules bounce around and, and hit each other and so on. But but he's having the idea that they're, they're whirling around and they're pushing things aside through their whirling motion. In any case, so, so just to continue this bit, um, so that according to this doctrine, that is the Descartes theory, it imports very little, uh, whether the particles of the, it doesn't matter much, he's saying it imports very little, it's just old English, but it doesn't matter much, whether the particles of the air have the structure requisite to springs or be of any other form, however, how irregular soever, uh, since their elastical power is not made to depend upon their shape or structure, but upon their vehement agitation and, as it were, brandishing motion, which they receive from the fluid ether that swiftly flows between them and whirling about each of them independently from the rest, not only keeps those slender aerial bodies separated and stretched out, at least as far as the neighboring ones will permit, uh, which otherwise, by reason of their flexibleness and weight, would flag or curl 
but also makes them hit against and knock away from each other and consequently require more room than they would if they were compressed, they would take up. So he's imagining it's all whirling around and uh, he's describing uh, kind of how that how that pushes uh, how that pushes things outward, so to speak. Okay, so just to, to finish this this quote here, by these two differing ways, my lord, he says, I'm not sure who the lord who, who this particular book was dedicated to was. By these two differing ways, my lord, may the spring of the air be explicated. But though the former of them be that by which, which by reason of it seeming somewhat more easy, I shall for the most part make use in the following discourse. Yet am I not willing to declare uh, peremptor preemptorily for either of them against the other? And, um, Oops. Um, uh, and indeed, though I have in another treatise endeavored to make it probable that the returning of elastical bodies, if I may call them that, forcibly bent to their former position may be mechanically explicated, yet I must confess that to determine whether the motion of restitution in bodies proceed from this, that the parts of a body of a peculiar structure are put into motion by the bending of the spring or from the endeavor of some substance, some subtle ambient body whose passage may be opposed or obstructed or else is pressure unequally re resisted by reason of the new shape or magnitude. Oh boy, this is, this is very, um, very ponderous here. But basically he's got these two theories. It's either like a fleece of wool and its little springs or it's whirling vortices. That was, uh, uh, Boyle's idea of what gases might be made of. So the uh, and the spring of the air was either pressure in the air was either the result of these little pieces of fleece-like springs trying to uh, sort of straighten themselves, or it was the result of vortices hitting each other and bouncing off. Okay, so uh, this whole question, and we'll come to this later, of the possibility of gases being made of little things that were bouncing off each other. One of the things you needed to know to know whether that's how things worked um, the, uh, um, is to understand what actually happens when things bounce off each other. What are the laws of impact? And that was quite an obscure thing in those days. It's still a little bit of a hack, even in modern uh, solid mechanics. But in those days, it was it was quite obscure, and uh, people have been playing croquet and billiards for uh, since the 1300s, and that had obviously raised questions about: okay, you've got these billiard balls and they're bouncing off each other. How does that actually work? So, 1668, there was a um, uh, uh, the Royal Society had a kind of commission to understand laws of impact. And um, uh, a variety of um, of contributions were made to that. Um, some of the people. Let's see if I can uh, share this here. Um, so uh, I should should. Oops. One second. Um, oh no! Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is. Um, uh, uh, a um, something um, well, it's it's in French, right? Uh, on the movement of bodies um, through percussion, so to speak, and it's talking about what happens when when things bounce um, against each other. So some understanding was was developed for that about what uh, what would happen, the sort of laws of restitution, coefficient of restitution, and so on for for like um, uh, billiard balls bouncing against each other. But probably at the time, nobody had the idea and certainly nobody had the mathematical methodology to ask the question, what would happen if there was a whole giant collection of hard spheres bouncing against each other, which later on will become a model for gases. But back in those days, people knew what individual hard spheres would do, but the notion of very large numbers of them and how to deal with that hadn't really developed. Okay, so the next... Um, uh, the next sort of episode in this comes from Isaac Newton. 1687, he publishes his Principia Mathematica, the book that um, uh, in English, the title would be Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, uh, with the key idea of bringing in mathematics as a way to explain the natural world. 
to do natural philosophy. Galileo had done some things along those lines, but Newton really uh, kind of made a very serious effort in that direction and invented calculus and so on as a way to use mathematical methods to describe the natural world. So one of his big uh, innovations was his universal law of gravity, the inverse square law of gravitational attraction. And he did all kinds of things in his book. His, his book is set up very much like Euclid as a set of sort of propositions, not about geometry, but about the world. And so uh, Newton has um, uh, this um, proposition um, uh, 23 uh, theorem, um, uh, theorem 18, I guess. And what he's interested in here is um, uh, what happens when you have a a self-gravitating sphere of fluid. What happens if you have essentially a, a, a giant water drop-like thing, a giant sort of fluid that is being pulled together by gravity? A very reasonable thing to think about, something that would be a good sort of starting model for lots of kinds of planets, stars, things like this. So the question for that was, the inverse square law of gravity, and through sort of fancy calculus that people do still today, you work out what the force of gravity does to this sphere of material. But now the question is, what would be, uh, if that's a sphere of fluid, the gravity will tend to pull it in together. What will resist that? What is the spring of the fluid, so to speak, that pushes the pressure, that pushes against the 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 uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, pulling together through gravity. If you only had gravity, the thing would just collapse to a point, as it does in things like a black hole. But what resists that? So Newton wanted to figure out what would be the resistance in a in a fluid like air um, to uh, uh, to that kind of um, um, crushing together. What he concluded was that uh, he said maybe there's a one over r repulsive force between particles in a fluid. Gravity leads to one over R squared force of attraction. But he says maybe there's a one over R force of repulsion between particles in a fluid. So, um, and he, he explores that and he shows that if there is such a repulsive force, then you get essentially things like Boyle's law. So in other words, if the molecules are sort of, if, if, the, if the thing is made of individual atoms, so to speak, and the atoms are sort of locked in place, but they're pushing away from each other with a one over R force law, maybe they're being pulled together by gravity with a one over R squared force law. But in that case, the, the thing will, will satisfy a kind of a Boyle's law-like relationship for pressure and volume. Now, Newton got into some degree of detail about how this worked, and he talked about whether one particle would shield others from the force, but he concluded um, his words, uh, this is actually a translation from Latin, um, but whether elastic fluids do really consist of particles so repelling each other is a physical question. We have here demonstrated mathematically the property of fluids consisting of particles of this kind, that hence philosophers may take occasion to discuss that question where by philosophers, he means natural philosophers or people actually thinking about the way the world works. Well, given that Newton had said many things that people discovered were true, and it also said that the reason gases work the way they do is because there's one over our law of, of, of repulsion, uh, uh, that people just said, well, Newton probably got it right. And for the next century or two, people basically just assumed that Newton got it right, that's the way things work. Um, there was one exception, 1738, uh, Daniel Bernoulli. So Bernoulli, Daniel Bernoulli was a member of the rather prolific Bernoulli family of Bernoullis, so to speak. Um, and he had a very eclectic career spanning probability theory, elasticity theory, biostatistics, economics, and so on. But um, in 1738, he published a book on hydrodynamics. And um, mostly the book is concerned with things like Bernoulli's principle and, and how incompressible fluids work. But he has one section where he considers elastic fluids, fluids that you can compress and that behave sort of elastically like that spring of the air that Boyle was talking about. Um, and he has, uh, and he talks about, um, and he draws one picture. This is the picture up here. Draws this picture of something, this is supposed to be a gas made of lots of little corpuscles, 
are lots of little atom-like things, and it's being pushed down by this piston here. And he discusses, okay, if these little corpuscles are are, are pushing around, let me let me read you what he said, uh, translated from Latin. So he says, let the space uh, E C D F. He's being very geometrical here. Let the space contain very small particles in rapid motion as they strike against the piston E F and hold it up by their impact. They constitute an elastic fluid which expands as the weight P is removed or reduced. But if P is increased, it becomes denser and presses on the horizontal case CD, just as if it was endowed with no elastic property. So he's basically correctly understanding that if there are these little particles in motion, if you push, if you try and squash them down, they will exert a pressure back just by virtue of the way that they hit the walls of the container or this piston here. He goes on, the pressure of the air is increased not only by reduction in volume, but also by rise in temperature. As it is well known that heat is intensified as the internal motion of the particles increases, it follows that any increase in the pressure of the air has not changed its volume, uh, indicates more intense motion of its particles, which is in agreement with our hypothesis. So he says rather amusingly here, it is well known that heat is intensified as the internal motion of the particles increases. It may have been well known to him. It definitely wasn't well known to anybody else. Um, as it was after 1738, he wrote this. It's in sort of a corner of his hydrodynamics book. Nobody paid attention to it. and Nobody kind of took that as a way to understand how the uh, gases worked. So I think part of the reason for this is that people sort of assumed that heat had to have some material existence, that it had to be a manifestation of microscopic motion was way too abstract an idea. It also perhaps confused people that there was an observation, the observation of, of radiant heat, the fact that you know the sun can heat something up just by virtue of, of sort of a, the, the heat that, that behaves like light rays, that's infrared radiation. But that's kind of it. It seems like that's a thing that's streaming from the sun to us. It doesn't, um, and, and that doesn't uh, sort of suggest that heat is something that can be uh, sort of just in the motion of things. It has to be a material thing in some sense itself. So, what was this heat material supposed to be? Well, it was thought of as a fluid that was called caloric, that could suffuse matter. And for example, flow from hotter bodies to colder ones. So again, going very much back to the Democritus idea of fire corpuscles, fire atoms, this caloric was a fluid that would flow from one place to another. Uh, and that would be the thing that would be the heat that was in one, in one uh, body and not another, for example. So there was a notion of phlogiston, which was in the mid 1600s, uh, which had to do with uh, how combustion, how fire works. And um, in, in the confusing terminology of the time, uh, there was this uh, thing that was called the principle of fire, which was some a kind of a theory for how combustion works and sort of how fire and heat will be generated in the process of combustion. Like you could add together, as in fact, one, one even writes in chemical formula today, you know, you say in a chemical reaction, it's A plus B plus heat goes to such and such. Well, at that time, they thought the heat was a material substance, just like the other kinds of things. They didn't have chemical formulas like that yet, but, but that was kind of the, the notion. So, uh, the, but, but this was sort of one idea was sort of a phlogiston idea for how caloric worked. A slightly more mainstream view was that there were caloric particles that would collect around particles of matter. Particles of matter by this point were being called molecules after a term that Descartes had used in 1620. Um, and uh, that these caloric particles that would collect around other material particles would generate a repulsive force that would, for example, expand gases. And that in various circumstances, the caloric particles would move around corresponding to the transfer of heat. You know, 
today's world, now that we understand how heat works and that heat is to do with the microscopic motion of, 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 of atoms and so on, all of this idea about a caloric substance that flows as a material thing from one place to another seems very wrongheaded. It is, however, ironic that when we look in other places in physics, uh, for example, when we're talking about dark matter, um, we're, we're saying, well, you know, what is dark matter? Well, it's a feature of how gal galaxies rotate and so on, but uh, it must be made of particles. Just like people said, heat must be made of a fluid, because all we know about is fluids. People say dark matter must be made of particles because something else is not plausible. Now, you know, our uh, physics project has kind of uh, this notion of the structure of space. And if I were to give it a Victorian name, I would call it the dynamical theory of space, that there is a dynamics to space, just like people would later talk about a dynamical theory of gases kinetic theory of gases and so on. What we have in our physics project is kind of a dynamical theory of space. My guess is that dark matter will turn out to be something to do with the structure of space and not uh, a sort of an add-on notion of something which is today's version of a fluid that is a collection of kinds of particles. But anyway, you know, history of science does have a habit like other history of repeating itself. My guess is that dark matter will be seen one day as the caloric of our times. That is a thing that was an explanation in the framework that might have existed at that time, but wasn't really the correct explanation of what was going on. In any case, caloric theory of heat lasted for, well, a couple of hundred years, and it explained lots of phenomena. This is one feature of, of, of models in science, even, and we'll see that a bunch in the history of thermodynamics, even a bunch of theories which are in their kind of uh, in their framework, in the things they talk about, they're just completely wrong. But nevertheless, as a matter of of explanation and calculation, they managed to get the right answer. This is something that uh, we see again um, in uh, um, um, in that. Well, we see it in in Ptolemy versus Copernicus. Ptolemaic epicycles get the right answer for the motion of planets even though their foundation as a kind of structural description of, of the earth moving, uh, the, the, the sun moving around the earth and so on, isn't right. Calculationally, they do just fine. And the same was true of caloric theory. The caloric theory was calculationally fine, even if in some sense ontologically flawed. Well, okay. It lasted a couple of hundred years and it got very elaborate and got very calculational. And for example, Laplace, 1825, wrote his, his treatise of celestial mechanics and he computed many things about the motion of planets and so on. And he's computing things like uh, 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 speed of sound in gases, the ratio of specific heats and gases, all these things he computes on the basis of caloric theory and pretty much gets the right answer, even though he does have to do a little bit of fancy footwork, adding uh, the notion of caloric rays, which were sort of a, a version of caloric that would be associated with radiant heat as opposed to heat and substances. Well, even though it wasn't understood what heat ultimately was, one of the things that was important was that one could measure its attributes. So the uh, one question was, could you, could you measure temperature? Was there a notion of temperature that you could measure? Already in antiquity, there had been devices which used the expansion of things uh, under under uh, with increased temperature to produce pressure and and uh, generate mechanical motion, but uh, Galileo developed this thing in the early 1600s called the thermoscope, um, in which you would basically have heated liquid. The liquid expands. The liquids which expand when they're heated, um, the the heated liquid would be seen to expand up a tube, and you could measure how far it went up the tube, and that would tell you how hot the liquid had got. And so from this idea came the quickly came the idea of making thermometers and people were making thermometers out of all kinds of all kinds of liquids um including mercury for example which was a which was eventually a very popular one okay so then given that you could measure temperature you could correlate changes in temperature with things that you saw so the real tech of the time late 1700s was ballooning and so there was a particular french balloonist jacques charles um who um for whom it was very important to know 
you know, how does, since these were mostly hot air balloons, how does the volume of a gas increase with temperature? So he noted that there's a linear increase of the volume of a gas with temperature. That was another important piece of, of um, understanding the gas laws. So beginning of the 1800s, we get a Joseph Fourier, who was a science advisor to Napoleon. He was off with Napoleon in the campaign in Egypt and things like that. He developed um, uh, his analytical theory of heat, 1822. So, and what he was interested in was the question of, sort of things like, how does heat flow from here to there? He imagined that heat was a fluid. And he then discussed how does it, how do you go from something being one thing being hot to it heating up something else and so on. He was inventing uh, the heat equation and, and along with it Fourier analysis. So he begins his analytical theory of heat. It's in French. There's a translation by saying heat, like gravity, penetrates every substance of the universe. Its rays occupy all parts of space. The object of our work his analytical theory of heat, is to set forth the mathematical laws which this element, heat, obeys. The theory of heat will hereafter form one of the most important branches of general physics. So he's, he's trying to describe the dynamics of heat, so to speak. So later he has this thing he calls the principle of the communication of heat. He refers to molecules, but he basically, uh, and, and then he says, when two molecules of the same solid are extremely near and are at unequal temperatures, so he has the notion an individual molecule can have a temperature, the most heated molecule communicates to that which is less heated a quantity of heat exactly expressed by the product of the duration of the instant of the extremely small difference of the temperatures and of a certain function of the distance of the molecules. So he has this idea that molecules, there's a hot molecule, there's a cold molecule, and somehow heat is jumping from the hot molecule to the cold molecule, and that's how heat is moving around. Okay, so it's it's sort of interesting that um, uh, uh, you know Fourier is is really thinking of heat as this caloric substance, as a fluid. So that means he can describe it by equations that are like the equations, partial differential equations that are used to describe fluids. It's a bit ironic that Bernoulli who was a really big partial differential equations person in the use of, of that for hydrodynamics for the flow of fluids, actually was the one who, who thought of um, uh, gases really being um, made of corpuscles and that it wasn't, and, and talked about heat being to do with the motion of those corpuscles. So he didn't have a fluid-based view of heat, um, even though he'd introduced his whole work was on, on the flow of fluids and so on. Okay, so that's where things were beginning of the 1800s. Okay, so what happened next? Well, the big story of what happened next is heat got and heat and the dynamics of heat got a huge application, kind of a defining technology of the time. The um, uh, and that was the steam engine. And so, beginning of the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution is uh, in full swing in countries like England and so on. Um, and what drove it was the development of increasingly efficient steam engines. Originally, it had been critical. You know, there was all this question about, uh, you know, using coal, you know, the, the, the mining of coal in England, and the mines were filling up with water and you were trying to mine deeper. It's kind of the same story all over again. People say, you know, can we get, can we extract this kind of substance from, from uh, uh, from the earth, and people say, well, if you put enough, if you spend enough, you can extract it. And the issue was the coal mines had to be deeper. They were filling up with water. How are you going to pump the water out? That was what steam engines had been invented for. Um, but uh, 1712, there was already practical steam engine developed. But then James Watt, 1776, the other important event of 1776, um, invented um, his version of the steam engine and a uh, much more efficient version, and the whole steam engine technology, uh, it was the, the chat GPT of its time, um, started to take off, so to speak. And that's a comment which will be dated in the future. Um, anyway, the uh, so, okay, 
as soon as it was clear that you could make an efficient steam engine, everybody was trying to add little bells and whistles, quite literally in some cases, to their steam engines to make them more efficient. And there was a question of uh, how far would it go? How efficient could steam engines be made? It's kind of like the Moore's law for, for microprocessor development of its time. How efficient can the steam engines go? And how much mechanical work could ever be derived from a given amount of heat? And it was that question that, in the hands of a young French engineer named Sadi Carnot, began the development of the abstract science of thermodynamics and led to the second law. But actually, before we talk about Sadi Carnot, we have to talk about his dad, Lazare Carnot, who was uh, trained as an engineer and actually ascended to the very highest levels of French politics. He was involved both with the French Revolution. He's one of the people in sort of the, the sort of the pictures that show, you know, the uh, the the key people of the French Revolution and so on. There he is, Lazare Carnot is, is in those pictures. Uh, he was also involved with Napoleon. And uh, he was smart enough that um, when political winds were blowing the other way, he was out of the country. And the primary thing he did when he was out of political favor was he did mathematics and uh, mathematical engineering. And so the fact that he survived as long as he did um, without uh, running into trouble in the French Revolution or with Napoleon or whatever was that uh, he had a hobby and his hobby was mathematical engineering. And that's what he did when he was out of favor. So his first big work was 1778. He wrote a thing called Memoir on the Theory of Machines. And so by that point, the kind of mathematical and geometrical science of mechanics was pretty well developed. People knew how sort of individual objects um, would interact mechanically. That had been sort of initiated by Newton's laws um, and then developed about how, you know, you could get single, um, uh, you could get levers and pulleys and things like this. But um, Lazar Cano's objective was to understand the consequences of that science of mechanics for actual engineering machines with lots of different components in them. Kind of like the, uh, we have a product, uh, Wolfram System Modeler, was kind of like the, which is which deals with the modeling of systems with many components and the interactions between those different components and so on, you know, 10,000 components or whatever, the number of things, you know, I think there are like 30,000 components in a jet engine or something, dealing with those kinds of things. Anyway, Lazar Cano was kind of early to that business, thinking about kind of how would you take the known laws of physics and mechanics and apply them to a machine with lots of components. So, and could one find abstract general principles about the operation of such machines? A little bit of a, a shadow here of, of what will later happen with his son, Sadi Kano. Anyway, 1803, he's writing books like uh, on the geometrical theory of fortifications. You know, what shape should the walls of your city, of your fortification be in so that you can see the folks who are coming to attack you and they can't see you and you can do all kinds of things. But anyway, he published his um, book called Fundamental Principles of Mechanical Equilibrium and Movement. and in which uh, he argued for something which, for a while, and in a confusion of later history, was called Carnot's principle, Lazare Carnot's principle, that useful work in a machine will be maximized if accelerations or shocks of moving parts are minimized, that it, and, and that a machine with perpetual motion is impossible. So what he's saying is, if you have a machine and it keeps on going bang, bang, bang with its parts uh, hitting each other in a very percussive kind of way, that machine will not be maximally efficient. The best machine is one where everything just touches and very, very gently uh, kind of, um, uh, there, aren't, there aren't big shocks and accelerations. That's the first, first part of it, that it's that's what will maximize efficiency. But second part, perpetual motion is impossible. There isn't a machine that you can set in motion that will just keep doing its thing of moving its, its levers and gears around forever without ever being uh, coming to, to rest through friction and so on. So perpetual motion is impossible in a machine. Okay, that was uh, Carnot Senior. Okay, so now we come to Sadi Carnot, born in 1796, was largely educated, was kind of homeschooled by his, by his father until he went to college in 1812. Um, 
And one of the things that his father did as a Napoleon operative was that um, he was a part of this sort of apparatus for granting patents on inventions. And so he got to see all kinds of inventions and um, including all sorts of, you know, a, a steam engine paddle boat on the Seine River and things like this. But he saw lots of steam engines. And so presumably did the young Sadiq Arnaud, um saw lots of, uh, um, I'm sure it was a, a fun thing for the for the Carnot kids, there were two of them, to see the um, uh, see the strange inventions. But was at the time, by the way, Napoleon had this rule that if you were going to patent something, you had to make a copy of your machine and give it to the government. In fact, there's a little museum in Paris somewhere that has the um, uh, a bunch of a bunch of such devices that were collected at that time. Anyway, so presumably Sadiq Kano as a teenager saw lots of steam engines. Okay. Lazar Kano died in 1823. Sadi Kano was by that point a well-educated, but rather professionally undistinguished French military engineer. Um, and then suddenly, in 1824, at the age of 28, uh, one year after his father dies, he produces his, his one published work in his life. Uh, it's called Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire, and on machines to develop that that power, it's it's written in French. Um, I won't I won't horrify you with my poor French accent by telling you the title in French. But um, here, let me put that. Um, uh, I can show you. Um, let's see. Uh, there we go. Reflections on the motive power of of fire, motive power of heat. Uh, that's the the um, front page of Carnot's privately published um, 1824 book. So it's very similar, actually, to the, the elder Carnot's uh, style. I think it was written independently by Sadi Carnot. I don't think Lazar Carnot, uh, I think, uh, I'm sure Sadi Carnot discussed it with the elder Carnot, but I don't think that this, this book is not sort of the posthumous work, I think, of the elder Carnot. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more maybe later about the, the personality of Sadi Kano, which is, is kind of interesting. Um, okay, so let me um, read you the beginning of, of, uh, of, of Kano's book. Everyone knows that heat can produce motion, that it possesses vast motive power. None can doubt in these days when the steam engine is everywhere so well known. The study of these engines is of the greatest interest. Their importance is enormous. Their use is continually increasing, and they seem destined to produce a great revolution in the civilized world. Already the steam engine works our mines, impels our ships, excavates our ports and our rivers, forges iron, fashions wood, grinds grain, spins and weaves our clothes, transports the heaviest burdens, etc. It appears that it must someday serve as a universal motor and be substituted for animal power, waterfalls, and air currents. Why does this remind me of things people say about AI and LLMs today? Notwithstanding the work of all kinds done by steam engines, notwithstanding the satisfactory condition to which they have been brought today, their theory is very little understood, and the attempts to improve them are still directed almost by chance. People are doing engineering hackery. Does that remind one of neural nets or what? The question has often been raised whether the motive power of heat is unbounded, whether the possible improvements in steam engines have an assignable limit, a limit which the nature of things will not allow to be passed by any means whatever, or whether, on the contrary, these improvements may be carried on indefinitely. We propose now to submit these questions to a deliberate examination. Kind of makes me wonder about uh, the question of um, uh, kind of a similar analysis for um, um, uh, for um, for AIs, one of those uh, uh, learn from history and and um, repeat its successes kinds of ideas. Anyway, Carnot was very much a caloric theory person. So one of his big ideas was: don't worry that you've got a steam engine; it's got steam in it, and that's the thing that's hot. Just think about heat itself and the dynamics of heat itself. And answer the question: What does it mean? Um, what does the uh, um, um, let's see? The, uh, oh, did I? 
whoops, I, I was going to show you, sorry about that. I was going to show, that was the um, front of, uh, of Kano's book, which I don't think I, I think I didn't show you before. Okay, the, um, um, let's see. Uh, well, so the question was, what, could, what kind of meta model of steam engines could you make? What model of steam engines could you make that didn't depend on the details of the valves and the steam and all that kind of thing? It's, it's this kind of idea of meta modeling that we've been talking about very recently. Carnot was a very early person thinking about that. It was kind of the, uh, the same type of idea that Turing had, Alan Turing had when he was making this kind of meta model of a computer. This was the sort of meta model of a, of a, of a steam engine or what Carnot would call a heat engine, uh, an engine which was moving heat around. So, okay. What he assumed was that the generation of unbounded heat or unbounded mechanical work, i.e. perpetual motion, in the closed cycle operation of the machine was impossible. Okay, so that, that was something where he was kind of taking that from his father's work on machines. He was saying, let's generalize that idea that this, this heat engine operating in a closed cycle. So it's, you know, it's, it's got pistons, they're opening, closing, steam's coming in, it's going out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually it gets back to the same state it was in before. And in that closed cycle, it can't continually to generate more and more mechanical work or more and more heat that it has to be bounded. And then he asserts that the system would necessarily maximize efficiently maximize efficiency if it operated reversibly. Super confusing because Carnot's principle for mechanical machines was a principle due to Lazare Carnot about sort of metal levers and gears and so on. Basically, the same principle is being introduced by Sadi Carnot to talk about heat engines. Okay, so then he argued the production of motive power, what we would now call mechanical work, is then due in steam engines not to an actual consumption of caloric, but to its transportation from a warm body to a cold body, that is to its reestablishment of equilibrium. That turns out to be an important statement that's being made there. So that this that, really was an abstract heat engine that moves heat around. Okay, so how did he talk about this? Well, his book is mostly words, Fu formula is mostly related to ideal gases, tables of actual parameters for materials. But what's interesting is that even though the sort of underlying conceptual framework of caloric theory wasn't correct, the abstract arguments that he made, which were essentially logical consequences of reversibility and operating in a closed cycle and so on, were robust enough that that didn't matter. And he was able to show, famously for people who read thermodynamics textbooks, that there was a theoretical maximum efficiency for a heat engine that depended only on the temperatures of its hot and cold reservoirs of heat. Okay, so what's important in talking about the history of the second law is that in making this whole setup, Carnot essentially ended up introducing the second law. And, and, and saying that there would be, uh, as we talked about just now, that the transportation of heat from a warm body to a hotter, that is to its reestablishment of equilibrium. That's going to be kind of the story of the second law, that heat goes from a warm body to a cold body and then establishes equilibrium again. Well, let's see. Uh, Carnot's book at the time it was produced in, uh, um, in, in 1824 basically had no consequence at all. Nobody read it. Carnot himself died rather much in obscurity from a cholera epidemic in 1832, about nine months after Evariste Galois died in a duel. Um, Carnot died uh, at the age of 36. Again, confusingly, if you're tracing the history, there's another Sadi Carnot who shows up in French history. That's the nephew of the Sadi Carnot we're talking about. The nephew will later become president of France. Um, but the Sadi Carnot we're talking about died at the age of 36 rather than obscurity. 1834, a couple of years after he dies, Emile Clapeyron, uh, 
who was a rather distinguished French engineering professor and also steam engine designer, patenter of steam engine designs and so on, wrote a paper called Memoir on the Motive Power of Heat. So he starts off talking about Carnot's book. The idea which serves as the basis of his researches seems to me to be both fertile and beyond question. His demonstrations are founded on the absurdity of the possibility of creating motive power or heat out of nothing. He goes on. This new method of demonstration seems to me worthy of the attention of theoreticians. It seems to me to be free of all objection. In other words, he's kind of asserting that Carnot is just making kind of logical conclusions that do not depend on any kind of assertion about the way the world actually works. I believe that it is of some interest to take up this theory again. S. Carnot, avoiding the use of mathematical analysis, arrives by a chain of difficult and elusive arguments at results which can be eas deduced easily from a more general law, which I shall attempt to prove, says Clapeyron. Well, uh, I don't think Clapeyron, I think Clapeyron overstated his contribution, which really, uh, really amounts mostly to a, um, uh, to a restatement of what um, Carnot talked about. But one of the things that appears in Clapeyron's work is um, uh, that diagram, um, which is the representation of the Carnot cycle uh, with um, uh, pressure and volume uh, showing the the uh, the cycle that um, uh, this heat engine can go through. So that's a that's a that's a picture that is very much um, uh, that you see in textbooks today. And in fact, uh, if you look at um, uh, Clapeyron's uh, papers. You'll find quantities here. You know, it'll say dQ equals whatever. That's kind of what you would see in the thermodynamics book today. Q is the uh, is the um, uh, the the um, uh, absolute um, amount of of heat um, that um, uh, would be um, with the same notation as today invented at that time. Okay. Well, so now we've got this idea of heat engines. We've got a certain amount of uh, methodology around that. Um, let's let's move on to uh, to actually getting to the the sort of uh, the big statements of the second law in the mid 16 in the mid 1800s. So uh, we have to move back a bit because we actually have to come back and talk about what will become the first law of thermodynamics before we talk about the second law of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics is is fundamentally a statement of conservation of energy energy, mechanical energy plus thermal energy. But first of all, we have to talk about the conservation of energy at all. And um, uh, one of the implications of Newton's laws of motion from 1687 is that momentum is conserved, not energy, but momentum. What else might also be conserved, people asked. So Leibniz, for example, 1680s, was suggested that the um, quantity mv squared, mass times velocity squared, um, might be something that was conserved. He called it uh, vis viva, which is Latin for life force. There's a very grand title for this quantity, mv squared, the life force, the vis viva. Uh, that was a term that was used for a couple of hundred years, actually. The vis viva um, uh, might be conserved in addition to momentum. And so that meant um, the, the uh, you know, it was a little bit confusing because when you have an elastic collision, for example, um, you, where you have, um, uh, there are, you know, frictional forces and so on. For example, you bounce a ball, you drop it for a certain height, it bounces, but it doesn't bounce up to the same height that it was before. And that is a reflection of the fact that it's kinetic energy, that the energy is not, kinetic energy is not conserved. So this vis fever in its most obvious form wasn't something that was going to be conserved. So by 1807, the term energy had been introduced, but it was still not clear that energy was in any global sense conserved. So the, this idea that heat was something a bit like mechanical energy had been kind of floating around for a long time. But the relationship between heat as energy and mechanical energy wasn't at all clear. And caloric theory of heat implied that caloric was caloric itself, the fluid that represents heat, was conserved, 
So it wasn't something that one could imagine would be interconverted. It it alone was conserved. So it wasn't being interconverted with mechanical energy. Okay, so then we come to uh, 1798, Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford, uh, who had a, a colorful life, um, measured the heat produced by the process of mechanical process of boring a cannon. And um, he made the argument that in contradiction to caloric theory, there was actually some kind of correspondence between mechanical energy and amount of heat. So Rumford's experiment wasn't very accurate, and it took until the 1840s um, before more accurate experiments were done. And uh, the main people responsible for those was, were James Jewell in, in England and uh, Robert Mayer in Germany. Uh, James Jewell was uh, a successful brewer um, and uh, sort of amateur in the same sense that I'm an amateur scientist um, in the sense it wasn't what he did for a living, but he did it pretty seriously. Um, and uh, but but they had more accurate experiments that showed this sort of equivalence between mechanical energy, uh, mechanical work, and amount of heat. Um, okay, so then we get to 1847. William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, a uh, prolific young physicist who had just graduated from the mathematical tripos in Cambridge and was now at a young age installed as a professor of natural philosophy, i.e. physics, in Glasgow, started to be curious about this equivalence between heat and mechanical work. So a little bit earlier, a couple of years earlier, uh, Kelvin had spent some time in Paris, uh, primarily at a lab, a French government lab, basically, that was measuring properties of steam um, for, for practical steam engine purposes. And he learned about Carnot's work from Clapeyron's paper. Um, he had a hard time even getting a copy of, of Carnot's original book by that point, by, 18, by 1845. But one of the things that Kelvin addressed was there was a proliferation of different temperature scales. You know, you had one thermometer that used alcohol, another one that used mercury, one that worked this way, one that worked that way. They, were, they all had different scales of temperature that they were uh, using saying, well, this is a, you know, such and such a millimeters of mercury of, of, uh, of motion in this thermometer with this, uh, these characteristics and so on. So 1848, Kelvin realized that Carnot's concept of a pure heat engine, which at the time was assumed to be based on caloric, could be used to describe, to define an absolute scale of temperature in which, for example, at absolute zero, all caloric would have been removed from all substances. So there's a paper here, let me put this up. Um, and uh, there's a paper entitled On an Absolute Thermometric Scale Founded on Carnot's Theory of the Motive Power of Heat and calculated from Reynaud's uh, observations by Professor W. Thompson, later uh, Lord Kelvin, Fellow of St. Peter's College, which is what's now Peter House in, in Cambridge. Um, I just read a couple of these things just because it's kind of interesting. The determination of temperature has long been recognized as a problem of the greatest importance in physical science. It has accordingly been made a subject of most careful attention, especially in late years, of very elaborate and refined experimental researches. And we are thus at present in possession of of as complete a practical solution of the problem as can be desired, even for the most accurate investigations. The theory of thermometry is, however, as yet far from being in so satisfactory a state. The principle to be followed in constructing a thermometric scale might at first sight seem to be obvious, as it might appear that a perfect thermometer would indicate equal additions of heat as corresponding to equal elevations of temperature estimated by the number of divisions of its scale, etc. So he... Um, uh, he has a footnote here uh, about Carnot's work, and he says, in, in a way that is, is more blog-like than modern academic paper-like, he quotes Carnot here. He says, having ne never met with the original work, it is only through a paper by Monsieur Clapeyron on the same subject published in whatever, in 1834 and translated in the first volume of blah, 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 that the author has become acquainted with Carnot's theory. Uh, be nice if people had those kinds of... Uh, of side comments as I try to have uh, when they talk about scientific things these days. Okay, well, anyway, Kelvin found Carnot's ideas useful and um, uh, 
he um and that's how he came up with his absolute scale of temperature which would now be called this is now what we call uh the kelvin scale and when we talk about absolute temperatures in terms of kelvins that's where that came from that was that was this paper that was derived from Carnot's idea about the pure heat engine independent of substance the pure thermometer independent of substance albeit that was being thought about in terms of heat as properties of caloric okay so by this point kelvin was convinced Carnot's ideas were useful so 1849 he writes some um, a uh uh a 33 page summary of Carnot's um of Carnot's book uh, it was kind of amusing when you when you look through these old documents you you find all kinds of things so looking through the the journal that contains Calvin's work the immediately preceding paper is by a certain James Clark Maxwell who was then 17 years old and it's called on the theory of rolling curves um but in any case and the, and the paper that follows is actually, again, Small World by a certain James Thompson, older brother of William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, that's called Theoretical Considerations on the Effect of Pressure in Lowering the Freezing Point of Water. So Small World, all those folks up in Scotland um, doing, um, uh, uh, who all knew each other, obviously, um, were, um, uh, were publishing in the same journal and so on. So this is what, um, um, what uh, Kelvin wrote, an account of Carnot's theory of the motive power of heat with numerical results derived, deduced from Renault's experiments on steam. Um, and uh, he talks about um, talks about how this works, and he says um, uh, that um, um, Carnot's work is based, and this is this is the theme that's going to go through second law of thermodynamics all over the place. Carnot's work is being based not so much in physics and experiment, but on the strictest principles of philosophy. And that's how people eventually will come to think of the second law as being something which is not a matter of empirical observation, but instead a matter of essentially proof. And uh, as we'll find out, uh, I'll talk about when I talk about the things I've tried to figure out recently, it is a totally fascinating thing that the second law of thermodynamics, Einstein's equations for gravity, and essentially the Feynman path integral for, for quantum mechanics, all three of those seem to have the same origins. And they all seem to be as provable, if you can call it that, as each other, and as empirical as each other. They're all really of the same nature. We had thought before that something like Einstein's equations was just sort of wheeled in as a, a fact of nature, not a derivable thing, likewise quantum mechanics, but the second law was much more derivable. We'll talk a bunch more about that later. But I think one of the things that's come out of what, what I've tried to do is the realization that they are all three of the same kind of uh, philosophical status in terms of, of their, uh, their kind of um, uh, their establishment from general features of things like the nature of observers, uh, ideas about how computation works and so on. Okay, so uh, Kelvin, at this point, he's writing about Carnot. He's a little bit squiggly in talking about uh, uh, caloric. Um, he does mention it one time, but mostly in this paper, he talks about thermal agency. So he talks about how may the amount of this thermal agency necessary for performing a given quantity of work be estimated. Okay, so, uh, and he talks about, and again, this all gets very, very, very confused over the spread out over a century and a half, but it's already confused at this point because he's talking about Carnot's fundamental principle where uh, that after a complete cycle, uh, an engine can be treated as back in the same state. And then he says in the, in the footnote here, uh, Carnot's fundamental principle, the quantity of heat thus discharged during a complete revolution or double stroke of the engine must be precisely equal to that which enters the water of the boiler, blah, blah, blah. So generally is Carnot's principle, remember there was a Lazar Carnot's principle, which was about something completely different, tacitly admitted as an axiom. That is, that its application in this case has never, so far as I'm aware, 
been questioned by practical engineers. So in other words, he's saying, Carnot is kind of introducing it in his logical development as an axiom, but look, nobody worries about it. Everybody knows it's true. Now, later on, we're going to discover that through a back route, basically one's going to conclude, well, everybody knew the second law was true. So, so we know it's true, but then we're trying to prove it, but we can't quite get the proof, but it's true anyway. Everybody gets very confused. Okay. This is this is something about the origin of those confusions. Um, well, anyway, so then he goes on and uh, talks about um, uh, his first use of the term thermodynamic. A perfect thermo-dynamic engine of any kind is a machine uh, by means of which the greatest possible amount of mechanical effect can be obtained from a given thermal agency, etc. Okay. So then, uh, in the in the uh, erstwhile tradition of the most important things in papers being in their footnotes, he has a big footnote here, um, and this is um, uh, in which he has the statement that no energy can be destroyed. But I think, um, let's see. Uh, Let's see. I mean, he's he's talking about uh, Joule's experiments on mechanical equivalents of heat and so on. Um, and he then ends with this, encouraged by this example from Joule's uh, work, we may hope that the very perplexing question in the theory of heat by which we're at present arrested will before long be cleared up. Um, it might appear that the difficulty will be entirely avoided by abandoning Carnot's fundamental axiom a view which is strongly urged by Mr. Jewell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we do so, however, we meet with innumerable other difficulties insuperable without further experimental investigation and an entire reconstruction of the theory of heat from its foundation. It is in reality to experiment that we must look either for a verification of Carnot's axiom, an explanation of the difficulty we've been considering, or an entirely new basis of the theory of heat. But... Um, uh, I mean, this is all very confused epistemologically, so to speak. I mean, at the, the, the end of, of for Calvin's paper, he's talking about how even though the theory seems to be based on a formal axiom, it should be experimentally tested. It's a little odd. It's either on a, based on a formal axiom and it's formally built up, or it's an ex, a matter of experiment, in which case we not really shouldn't really think of it as an axiom. It's a law of nature that has to be studied empirically. Um, I think, uh, uh, I mean, he talks here about um, um, the fact nothing in the whole range of natural philosophy is more remarkable than the establishment of general laws by such a process of reasoning. We have seen, however, that doubt may exist with reference to the truth of the axiom on which the entire theory is founded, and it therefore becomes more than a matter of mere curiosity to put the inferences deduced from it to the test of experience. So I guess what he's saying there is we'll just treat it as an axiom, but then let's find out what consequences it has. And if those are wrong, then we got to go back and, and figure out whether the axiom is wrong or not. It's interesting to compare that with the way that people think about mathematics and mathematical axioms. If, if it turns out that you can't prove this thing in set theory, does that mean you go back and reset the axioms of set theory? Interesting question. Well, not to be not to seem impractical at the end of his paper he has specific results about uh, the the uh Fowey consoles experiment and the taylor's engine at the united mines and the F english engines according to i see they had a, a standard government contract for how they were supposed to work the average actual performance of performance of cornish engines presumably engines operating the mines in cornwall Etc. 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 So he has very specific uh, uh, sort of statements about actual numerical um, uh, characteristics of these steam engines. I I can't help but notice the similarity to the sort of tables of of uh, how the the characteristics of LLMs and so on in today's world, um, and which are similarly a little bit hard to to nail down exactly what the numbers should be. Okay. Well. Uh, Okay, so meanwhile, Jewell and Mayer 
have been doing these experiments on, uh, for example, grinding things and finding how the mechanical motion of that grinding was being converted to heat. And was it being converted or was heat conserved as one might expect from the caloric theory of heat? So 1849, new idea, perhaps heat was a form of energy. And when, when heat was accounted for, even when you bored out this, this thing and you, you've sort of mechanical energy has been expended, that somehow the total energy, if you included the heat energy, would be conserved. And this, uh, um, if that was the case, one might think, well, all energy might be associated with the vis viva, this kinetic energy. Some of the kinetic energy will be large scale of big things moving around, and some will be small scale, that is molecules running around and sort of keeping the energy in their microscopic motions. And that, again, suggested this idea that, that gases might consist of molecules in motion. Well, so then uh, Kelvin, ever the some, sometime opportunist, I suppose, gets into the act again with a paper on the dynamical theory of heat with numerical results deduced from Mr. Joule's equivalent of a thermal unit and Mr. Renault's observations on steam. Okay, so uh, confusingly, this is 1851, he refers back to Sir Humphrey Davy, very distinguished British chemist and uh, experimentalist, who we'll talk about in a minute, but um, who had done kind of as a kid, had sort of talked about the experiment of melting two pieces of ice by rubbing them together. So, um, and Kelvin, who I think was a little bit politicking of uh, kind of be nice to, to Humphrey Davy at this point, was, was saying that um, Humphrey Davy had established the following proposition. The phenomena of repulsion are not dependent on a particular elastic fluid for their existence, or caloric does not exist. He concludes that heat consists of motion excited among the particles of bodies. So he's attributing to Humphrey Davy, I think not really quite correctly, the idea that heat um, consists of a motion excited among the particles of bodies. To distinguish this motion from others and to signify the cause of our sensation of heat and of the expansion or expansive pressure produced by in matter by heat, the name repulsive motion has been adopted. Didn't catch on. But the dynamical theory of heat, thus established, not really, by Sir Humphrey Davy, is extended to radiant heat by the discovery of phenomena, especially those of the polarization of radiant heat, which render it excessively probable that heat propagated through vacant space vacuum or through diathermane substances um, consists, that means, uh, um, what does that mean? That means um, substances that sort of preserve heat. It's, it's the diathermal is like adi what we now call adiabatic. Uh, consists of waves of transverse vibrations in an all-pervading medium. That's talking about some um, sort of uh, radiant heat as being some kind of thing transmitted through what would later be called the luminiferous ether. Um, well, so, uh, all right, the, to, he's talking about the, the idea that the magnetoelectric uh, excitation of galvanic currents, et cetera, Either of them will be sufficient to demonstrate the immateriality of heat and would so afford if required a perfect confirmation of Sir Humphrey Davy's views. Considering as it is as thus established that heat is not a substance, but a dynamical form of mechanical effect, we perceive that there must be an equivalence between mechanical work and heat as between cause and effect. So he's kind of quoting... Humphrey Davy, distinguished scientist at the time, as sort of uh, as having an anti-caloric experiment from much earlier. I, I tried to track down where did that uh, statement about Humphrey Davy really come from. Well, it seems to have come from this rather strange piece that was um, uh, was a thing called "Contributions to Physical and Medical Knowledge," principally from the west of England, uh, collected by Thomas Beddoes, M.D. Um, and uh, uh, and this is kind of like a, a sort of an almost aphoristic anonymous quote uh, 
that apparently was due to the teenage Humphrey Davy. And that's kind of what what uh, what Kelvin is is um, is talking about. But Kelvin himself um, uh, has this is is kind of um, um, is talking about the dynamical theory of heat here. What he wants to do is to show what modifications of the conclusions arrived at by Carnot and by others who followed his peculiar mode of reasoning regarding the motive power of heat must be made when the hypothesis of the dynamical theory. Contrary as it is to Carnot's fundamental hypothesis, that is of caloric theory, is adopted. So to point out the significance in the dynamical theory of numerical results obtained, deduced from Renault's observations on steam and communicated about two years ago to the society, I think that's the Royal Society, um, with an account, it might be the Edinburgh Society, I'm not sure, with an account of Carnot's theory by the author of the present paper, and to show that by taking these numbers, subject to correction when accurate experimental data regarding the density of saturated steam shall have been afforded, in connection with Joule's mechanical equivalent of a thermal unit, a complete theory of the motive power of heat within the temperature limits of the experimental data is obtained. And then he says, another objective, to point out some remarkable relations connecting the physical properties of all substances established by reasoning analogous to that of Carnot, but founded in part on the contrary principle of the dynamical theory. So then, da -da -da -da, we have the next thing. He says, once he wants to do, the demonstration of the second proposition is founded on the following axiom. It is impossible by means of inanimate material agency to derive mechanical effect from any portion of matter by cooling it below the temperature of the coldest of the surrounding objects. So in other words, it's, um, let's see, the, the, um, this is basically saying heat doesn't go from a colder object to a hotter object. You can't derive mechanical effect um, by, let's see, the right you 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 can't you can't basically take uh take this it's a slightly obscure version of the second law let's let's look at the footnote here so he has a footnote and his footnote says if this axiom be denied for all temperatures it would have to be admitted that a self-acting machine might be set to work and produce mechanical effect by cooling the sea or earth with no limit but the total loss of heat from the sea and earth, or in reality, from the whole material world. So in other words, you could get a perpetual motion machine by just uh, turning heat into mechanical work. It's important to notice here, and we'll talk about it more later, that he talks about uh, it's impossible by means of inanimate material agency. So he is carving out the possibility that a living system, or maybe a human, could do something different from what he is saying will happen in inanimate matter. Okay, so then, oh gosh, this is this history is complicated. I I must say, um, uh, let me see. Um, let me get to here. Okay. Um. All right. At this point, again, this is complicated. So Kelvin is writing this in 1851, I think, 52 maybe. Um, and it's a long paper, but he says uh, that this axiom, which I think will be generally admitted, which amounts to the second law of thermodynamics, it is with no wish to claim priority that I make these statements, as the merit of first establishing the proposition upon correct principles is entirely due to Clausius, who published his demonstration of it in the month of May last year in the second part of his paper on the motive power of heat. I may be allowed to add that I have given the demonstration exactly as it occurred to me before I knew that Clausius had either enunciated or demonstrated the proposition. The following is the axiom on which Clausius's demonstration is founded. So this is now quoting Rudolf Clausius, who we'll talk about in a little bit. 
Hausius said, is impossible for a self-acting machine unaided by any external agency to convey heat from one body to another at a higher temperature. So in other words, there's again a statement of heat doesn't flow from a colder body to a hotter one. It is easily shown that although this and the axiom I have used are different in form, either is a consequence of the other. The reasoning in each demonstration is strictly analogous to that which Carnot originally gave. So it's kind of a, a, a thing a little bit like uh, Alan Turing, Alonzo Church in um, 1935, 1936, coming up with seemingly different but ultimately equivalent definitions of computation. So similarly here, these folks have come up with seemingly different but ultimately equivalent statements of the second law of thermodynamics. And um, so uh, let's see. The um, um, okay, so so Kelvin's exposition on the dynamical theory of heat is a really long thing. It, it's in four installments. Uh, uh, it reminds me of of um, uh, it was long, just like some things that I tend to write can be long. It had lots of stuff in it though. Um, and uh, next he has some. Uh, sort of detailed things about um, uh, um, detailed derivations, comparisons with experiment, and so on. Um, but actually, before he even publishes the um, uh, part four of his exposition, he publishes other pieces. So he's off and running now, and he publishes a piece uh, on the mechanical action of radiant heat or light on the power of animated creatures over matter on the sources available to man for the production of mechanical effect. So he emphasizes that the main uh, source of energy on Earth um, is the sun. And um, later he will conclude, uh, this is uh, before 1900, he's concluded that um, uh, you know, uh, um, fossil fuels are a bad idea. We're going to run out of coal. Um, and we should stop using fossil fuels. And he argues for the value of of, uh, um, of, of solar power um, rather early for doing that. But anyway, um, uh, he talks about heat radiated from the sun, sunlight being included in this term, is the principal source of mechanical effect available to man. From it is derived the whole mechanical effect obtained by means of animals working, water wheels worked by rivers, steam engines, and galvanic engines, that's electrical, and part at least of the mechanical effect obtained by means of windmills and the sails of ships not driven by the trade winds. And he talks about some um, the motions of the earth, moon, and sun and their mutual attractions constitute an important source of available mechanical effect from them all, but uh, uh, but chiefly, no doubt, from the earth's rotation of motion is derived the mechanical effect of water wheels driven by the tides and so on. So he also wonders in here how animals actually manage to produce mechanical work, noting that the animal body does not act as a thermodynamic engine, and it is very probable that the chemical forces produce the external mechanical effects through electrical means. So that's uh, kind of imagining something about nerves um, and muscles and so on. So uh, a curious inference is pointed out that an animal will be sensibly less warm in going uphill than in going downhill, were the breathing not greater in the former case than in the latter. The application of Carnot's principle and Joule's discovery regarding the heats of electrolysis and the calorif calorific effects of magnetoelectricity is pointed out, according to which it appears nearly certain that when an animal works against resisting force, there is not a conversion of heat into external, external mechanical effect, but the full thermal equivalent of the chemical forces is never produced. In other words, that the animal body does not act as a thermodynamic engine, and very probably the, the chemical forces produce the external mechanical effects through electrical means. So uh, animals are not steam engines. Okay, so then we get to an important paper, um, which is, uh, again, he hasn't even finished his whole four-part piece on, um, uh, um, on the dynamical theory of, of heat, but he has a paper at this point 
called um, On a Universal Tendency in Nature to the Dissipation of Mechanical Energy. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So let's look at what he actually says here. The object of the present communication is to call attention to the remarkable consequences which follow from Carnot's proposition that there is an absolute waste of mechanical energy available to man when heat is allowed to pass from one body to another at a lower temperature by any means not fulfilling his criterion of a perfect thermodynamic engine established on a new foundation in the dynamical theory of heat. As it is most certain that creative power alone, capital C, capital P, can either call into existence or annihilate mechanical energy the waste referred to cannot be annihilation, but must be some transformation of energy. Okay, so what's he saying here? Basically, he's saying creative power alone can call into existence or, or annihilate mechanical energy. Um, basically, he's saying energy is conserved unless creative power, which is his version of, of saying God, can create or destroy energy. He's saying in the universe, without sort of divine agency, energy is conserved. So to explain the nature of this transformation between mechanical energy and, and this waste, uh, it is convenient in the first place to divide stores of mechanical energy into two classes, statical and dynamical. A quantity of weights at a height, ready to descend and do work when wanted, an electrified body, a quantity of fuel, contains stores of mechanical energy of the statical kind. Masses of matter in motion, a volume of space through which undulations of light or radiant heat are passing, a body having thermal motions among its particles, that is not infinitely cold, contains stores of mechanical energy of the dynamical kind. So by statical, he's meaning this kind of large-scale mechanical processes. By dynamical, he means microscopic motion. The following propositions are laid down regarding the dissipation of mechanical energy from a given store and the restoration of it from its primitive to its primitive condition. The necessary consequence of the axiom quotes, it is impossible by means of inanimate material agency to derive mechanical effect from any portion of matter by cooling it below the temperature of the coldest of its surrounding objects, he says, quoting his earlier paper. When heat is created by a reversible process so that the mechanical energy thus spent may be restored to its primitive condition, there is also a transference from a cold body to a hot body of a quantity of heat bearing the quantity bearing so the quantity created a def definite proportion depending on the temperature of the two bodies. That's, that's a statement of Carnot's principles about efficiency of heat engines. When heat is created by an unreversible process, we now say irreversible process, such as friction, there is a dissipation of mechanical energy and a full restoration of it to its primitive condition is impossible. That's, a, that's the second law of thermodynamics. Things tend to get more random things are dissipated as heat, and the energy is not recoverable for useful purposes. Number three here, when heat is diffused by conduction, there is a dissipation of mechanical energy and perfect restoration is impossible. So again, same story, but he's talking not about friction, but about conduction, etc. So he ends this piece with um, uh, the following general conclusions are drawn from the proposition stated above and known facts with reference to the mechanics of animal and vegetable bodies. There is at present in the material world a universal tendency to the dissipation of mechanical energy, second law. Any restoration of mechanical energy without more than the equivalent of dissipation is impossible in inanimate material processes and is probably never affected by means of organized matter either endowed with vegetable life or subjected to the will of an animated creature. Number three, within a finite period of time past, the earth must have been, and within a finite period of time to come, the earth must again be unfit for the habitation of man as at present constituted, unless operations have been or are, be, are to be performed, which are impossible under the laws to which the known operations going on at present in the material world are subject. So in one year, he's jumped from Carnot has an axiom which we have to test. Two, we're going to conclude things about the infinite future and the possibility of the habitability of the Earth. And that um, there is, uh, in the material world, a universal tendency to the dissipation of mechanical energy. So notice that this didn't get proved. This just got asserted. And then it got sort of entrained in this kind of large-scale description of, of what the consequences would be. So 
uh, it's it's interesting that he talks about he has this whole thing about vegetable bodies and animal bodies and will and so on. I think he's he's dancing around um, the uh, uh, the idea that by our will, by human by human will of constructing machines and so on, we can't violate second law, but but maybe God can. That's what he's kind of dancing around. And and maybe uh, maybe we humans have some innate ability to do it. Maybe our very existence violates the second law, and that's our sort of God-given feature, so to speak. We'll talk later about Kelvin and his some of his religious beliefs and so on, which play into all of this. Well, okay, so so we get um, uh, he's some um, uh, just to sort of technify his paper. He's got triple integrals there, and he's got Carnot functions and all sorts of things like this. But basically, he's making this this qualitative statement about the dissipation of energy. And um, uh, but somehow he's jumping from that qualitative statement to this kind of idea that the universe is going to be subject to this heat death, and the Earth is going to be uninhabitable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's. Uh, um, and, and by the way, he's adding this twist. The Earth is going to be an uninhabitable uh, beyond uh, it, it's some um, uh, unless something beyond the known operations going on at present in the material world save it. So he's looking for, I think, God to swoop in and save the world for humans, um, which otherwise wouldn't happen, he says, because the second law is just turning everything into heat. Well, within a few months, Kelvin's colleague, a chap called William Rankin, uh, after whom another temperature scale is named, the, the Fahrenheit analog of the Kelvin scale of temperature, um, is uh, Rankin had been involved with the first law of thermodynamics, but he is trying to save the world um, for, um, uh, for humans and others um, by coming up with a hypothesis about um, on the reconcentration of mechanical energy of the universe by um, William John McCorn Rankin. Uh, so he says that um, there's conservation of energy and so on. He talks about the second law. He says, the experimental evidence is everyday accumulating of a law which has long been conjectured to exist that of all the different kinds of physical energy in the universe are mutually convertible, that the total amount of physical energy, whether in the form of visible motion or mechanical power of light, heat, magnetism, electricity, or chemical agency, or in other forms not yet understood, is unchangeably the transformations of its different portions from one of those forms to of power into another, and their transference from one portion of matter to another constituting the phenomena which are the objects of experimental physics. So that's that's a rather flowery version of the law of conservation of energy. But then he talks about, uh, then he goes on and he talks about um, the uh, 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 the second law. He says, on the other hand, all visible motion is of necessity ultimately converted entirely into heat by the agency of friction. There is thus in the present state of the known world a tendency towards the conversion of all physical energy into, a so into the sole form of heat. Heat, moreover, tends to diffuse itself uniformly by conduction and radiation until all matter shall have acquired the same temperature. There is consequently, Professor Thompson concludes, that's Kelvin, so far as we understand the present condition of the universe, a tendency towards a state in which all physical energy will be in the state of heat, and that heat so diffused that all matter will be at the same temperature, so that there will be an end of all physical phenomena. So, big jump from this kind of let's assume the second law to it's going to end the universe. So, so how does Rankin save us? Um, he says, vast as the speculation may seem, it appears to be soundly based on experimental data and to represent truly the present condition of the universe so far as we know it. Big jump from what was actually shown. My object now is to point out how it is conceivable that at some indefinitely distant period, an opposite condition of the world may take place in which the energy which is now being diffused may be reconcentrated into foci and stores of chemical power again produced from the inert compounds which are now being continually formed. 
There must exist between the atmospheres of the heavenly bodies a material medium capable of transmitting light and heat, some kind of luminiferous ether through which light can be transmitted. And it may be regarded as almost certain that this interstellar medium is perfectly transparent and diathermous. That is to say that it is incapable of converting heat or light, which is a species of heat, from the radiant into the fixed or conductible form. If this be the case, the interstellar medium must be incapable of acquiring any temperature whatsoever, and all heat which arrives in the conductible form at the limits of the atmosphere of a star or planet will there be totally converted, partly into ordinary motion by the expansion of the atmosphere, and partly into the radiant form. The ordinary motion will again be converted into heat, so that radiant heat is the ultimate form to which all physical energy tends. And in this form, it is in the present condition of the world, diffusing itself from the heavenly bodies through the interstellar medium. So he says, everything is going to turn into what we now think of as streams of photons or something. Everything's going to turn into the radiant form of heat, he says. Now, okay, this is the big save coming up. Let it now be supposed that in all directions around the visible world, the interstellar medium has bounds beyond which there is empty space. So in other words, we're in a bubble. The universe, there's a universe, there's the luminiferous ether, the medium, the interstellar medium ends somewhere. If this conjecture be true, then on reaching those bounds, the radiant heat of the world will be totally reflected. We're in a raindrop, and the light is hitting the edge of the raindrop, and it's being totally internally reflected. And, well, anyway, he says the, the heat of the world will be totally reflected and will ultimately be reconcentrated into foci. At each of these foci, the intensity of heat may be expected to be such that should a star, being at that period an extinct mass of inert compounds, in the course of its motions arrive at that part of space, it will be vaporized and resolved into its elements, a store of chemical power being thus reproduced at the expense of a corresponding amount of radiant heat. Thus it appears that although from what we can now see of the known world, its condition seems to tend continually towards the equable diffusion in the form of radiant heat of all physical energy, the extinction of the stars and the cessation of all phenomena, yet the world as now created may possibly be provided within itself with a means of reconcentrating its physical energies and renewing its activity in life. For aught we know, these opposite processes may go on together, and some of the luminous objects which we see in distant regions of space may be not stars, but foci in the interstellar ether. So we've got the universe in not a grain of sand, but in a drop of interstellar medium of luminiferous ether. There's all energy is being turned into radiant heat. It's being totally internally reflected. It's being, because it's assumed, presumably, he assumes it's a spherical uh, region. It's being reconstituted into, into foci. And at those foci, things are being uh, sort of systematically heated up and stars are being reignited and the world is coming back to life again. So uh, it's, um, let's see, I can, um, well, so Rankin has jumped in a year from sort of these basic statement of the second law of thermodynamics as a kind of semi-empirical statement to its conclusions about cosmic future to ways to save the conclusion of everything's going to turn into heat and it's all downhill from there, so to speak. Um, well, let's see. Uh, maybe I can, let's see. I think, uh, let me just see something here. Yeah. Well, let me maybe, um, I'm, I'm realizing that I have lots of material here and um, uh, we're barely uh, in the, the history of the second law is complicated, and I think it's going to take many, um, many sessions to really go through it all. We're, we're really still at the very early stages of kind of um, the development of the second law. But maybe let me get through kind of the the basic um, statements, early statements of the second law, and then we'll uh, we'll call it a day for today. Um, well, Kelvin, uh, this is some, um, uh, he's talking about, Kelvin goes on, independent of these cosmic kinds of speculations, he goes on actually looking at the the, the sort of technical details of the dynamical theory of gases. Um, and uh, he talks about, um, 
the ideal gas law, PV equals RT, the thing that Boyle had started off in 1660 with talking about PV equals was constant and so on. Then it got added to by people like Charles and so on. Um, but uh, uh, the question is, is that always true? And Kelvin is establishing the fact that it isn't always true and that um, um, uh, and that has consequences for thinking about gases as collections of molecules bouncing around. Um, it, it means that they can't just be hard spheres bouncing around. There has to be a little bit more to it. But anyway, Kelvin is not deterred, despite sort of the technical work from various kinds of cosmic speculations. He suggests that gravity, rather than creative power, might in reality be the ultimate created antecedent of all motion. Um, and he says, uh, published speculations were referred to by which it is shown to be possible that the motions of the Earth and of heavenly bodies and the heat of the sun may all be due to gravitation, or that the potential energy of gravitation may in reality, that may be in reality the ultimate created antecedent of all motion, heat and light at the present time existing in the universe. Um, well, okay, as as Kelvin, um, the uh, um, Kelvin himself got a bit distracted at this point. This was 1850s, and um, in a in a quite different story. Kelvin got involved in the practical electrical problem of laying a transatlantic telegraph cable. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that another time. But um, uh, he was a very much point of action physicist at that point. Um, and he's quite successful with it because he invented the, the apparatus and was actually there telling people how fast to spool out the, um, the cable going across the Atlantic. And uh, it was a big investment fiasco of the first few cables broke um, uh, somewhere in the mid-Atlantic. And Kelvin was the one who sort of said how to do it right and managed to successfully lay a transatlantic cable. And that caused Kelvin to start his first company and start his path towards entrepreneurism, which, among other things, allowed him a little bit later to do things like buy a mega yacht of the time, only a 126-ton yacht, but that's still pretty big. Um, the biggest these days are like a 1,000 tons and things, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, but, uh, but while he was... Uh, uh, Pooling around the Atlantic on these uh, cable laying ships, he also continued to write physics papers, and occasionally he talked about thermodynamics. And um, uh, more often, he used thermodynamics as a way to talk about other things, um, like how old is the sun? He estimated a little bit peculiarly that the sun was thirty-two thousand years old, which isn't quite right, obviously. Um, and he talked about how you know the energy of the sun might come from meteorites falling into it and so on. But of course, he didn't know about chemical react and nuclear reactions. He didn't know about radioactivity and things. So he didn't really know the the, the dynamics of, of how the sun works. Okay, well, the idea about inevitable dissipation of useful energy spread pretty quickly. By 1854, uh, Hermann von Helmholtz um, was talking about them. Uh, Helmholtz was had been trained as a doctor, became a surgeon to a German military regiment by 1843. But he was also doing experiments and developing theories about animal heat and how muscles managed to do mechanical work. So, for example, 1845, he publishes a paper on metabolism during muscular activity. So it's like, how does the energy, how do we get the energy? How do we, what's the relationship between the heat of animals and so on and their uh, and the way that they produce mechanical energy through muscles. So 1847, he was one of the inventors of the law of conservation of energy, first law of thermodynamics, um, and uh, was actually really its clearest expositor at the time. Um, let's see. That's, uh, that's some of his, his writing about um, um, principle of conservation of force, he calls it, but um, it means energy there. Um, and uh, um, that's the mechanical equivalent of, of, of heat. So anyway, by 1854, Helmholtz had kind of ascended from being a mere military surgeon to being a physiology professor. And he also was beginning a distinguished career in physics. I mean, we continue into psychophysics and physiology and so on. And he was talking about the second law and its implications. So 
uh, his his he was a, he's a good expositor. So his his uh, English translation of uh, a contemporaneous English translation of his 1854 lecture about interaction of natural forces. A new conquest of, of very general interest has been recently made by natural philosophy. In the following pages, I will endeavor to give a notion of the nature of this conquest. It has reference to a new and universal natural law, which rules the action of natural forces in their mutual relations towards each other, and is, influential, is as influential on our theoretic views of natural processes as it is important in their technical applications. Among the practical arts which owe their progress to the development of the natural sciences from the conclusion of the Middle Ages onwards, practical mechanics, aided by the mathematical science which bears the same name, was one of the most prominent. The character of the art was, at the time, referred to naturally very differently from its present one. Surprised and stimulated by its own success, it thought no problem beyond its power and immediately attacked some of the most difficult and complicated. Thus, was it was attempted to build automaton figures that should perform the functions of men and animals. It's, it's interesting to see him use the term automaton. Um, I've worked a lot on things like cellular automata. The word automaton is a very old one. It's, uh, it was even around in the 1600s. And, um, uh, but it's interesting to see it be used here. Um, automaton, as soon as there were clockwork figures and kind of little clockwork toy-like things, people were talking about automata and, and reproducing uh, as he's saying, functions of men and animals, um, people and animals, whatever, um, uh, to uh, um, uh, that, that, what, that there was a sort of mechanical way to do that. It's an interesting concept that um, 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 the, uh, the that it should be possible to do that. That's a thing that is really reflected in quite separate issue of, of sort of modern times of of. Um, the, the, the fundamental theory of biology, which we will come to in talking about the second law of thermodynamics later. Okay, so from these efforts to imitate living creatures, another idea also by a misunderstanding seems to have developed itself, which as it were formed the new philosopher's stone of the 17th and 18th century. It was by now the endeavor to construct a perpetual motion. So in other words, from observing, imitating living creatures, he's saying, People imagine that there could be perpetual motion machines, that you just this creature just keeps on moving forever, and there's nothing coming in, so to speak, and just keeps on keeps on moving, so he says. Presumably the creature has to eat, but he's that's what he's about to probably discuss. Um let's see. The uh let's see. Um he's talking about um uh Okay, so he's saying, first of all, he he kind of dispenses with the idea that perpetual motion can be achieved by generating energy from nothing, in other words, violating the first law, but then has a little anecdote. He says that um, uh, there's this magnetoelectric machine decomposed the water and thus continually prepared its own fuel. He says, this would certainly have been the most splendid of all discoveries, a perpetual motion machine, which besides the force which kept it going, generated light like the sun and warmed all around it. The matter was by no means badly cogitated. Each practical step in the affair was known to be possible. But those which at the time were, were acquainted with the physical investigations whereupon the subject could have affirmed on the first hearing the report that the matter was to be numbered among the numerous stories of the fable-rich America, and indeed a fable it remained. So in other words, somebody in America said they had a perpetual motion machine, and it wasn't true. Um, and he says, uh, as a as a kind of um, uh, a, a new world bashing European, that there were many fables in America. Well, talks about the second law. It is not yet considered as actually proved, but some remarkable deductions having been drawn from it and afterwards proved to be facts by experiment, it has attained thereby a great degree of probability, the second law. Besides the mathematical form in which the law was first expressed by Carnot, we can give it in the following more general expression. Another statement of the second law. Only when heat passes from a warmer to a colder body, and even then only partially, can it be converted into mechanical work. So this is now another, another statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, but then he goes on, again, goes cosmic, 
but the heat of the warmer bodies, uh, it's talking about the heat death of the universe, but the heat of the warmer bodies strives perpetually to pass to bodies less warm by radiation conduction and thus to establish an equilibrium of temperature. At each motion of a terrestrial body, a portion of mechanical force passes by friction or collision into heat, of which only a part can be converted back into mechanical force. This is also cease this also ceases. This is all oh. That's very odd. Maybe I have a mistake here. Huh. Okay, well, anyway. Um, all force will finally pass into the form of heat, and all heat come into a state of equilibrium. Then all possibility um of future change will be at an end, and the complete cessation of all natural processes must set in. The life of men, animals, and plants could not, of course, continue if the sun had lost its high temperature and with it it's his light. If all the components of the Earth's surface had closed those combinations which their affinities demand, in short, the universe from that time forward will be condemned to a state of eternal rest. So quite poetic. And... Um, uh, um, he's impressed that Kelvin was able to go from a mathematical formula to a global fact about the fate of the universe. Of course, it isn't turning out that that's um, true, but um, uh, he says, these consequences of the law of Carnot are, of course, only valid provided that the law, when sufficiently tested, proves to be universally correct. That is the second law. In the meantime, there is little prospect of the law being proved incorrect. At all events, we must admire the sagacity of Thompson who in the letters of a long known uh, of a long known little mathematical formula which speaks only of the heat volume and pressure of bodies was able to discern consequences which threatened the universe though certainly after an infinite period of time with eternal death and again he ends rather rather um uh poetically here um he's ending Thus, the thread which was spun in darkness by those who sought a perpetual motion has conducted us to a universal law of nature which radiates light into the distant nights of the beginning and of the end of the history of the universe. To our own race, it permits a long but not endless existence. It threatens it with a day of judgment, the dawn of which is still happily obscured. As each of us singly must endure the thought of his death, the race must endure the same. But above the forms of life gone by, the human race has higher moral problems before it, the bearer of which it is, and then the completion of which it fulfills its destiny. Kind of, uh, kind of poetic, but um, uh, uh, an interesting you know, deduction from this kind of flimsy evidence of the second law. It's, um, 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 we're now into these, these completely cosmic statements. All right, I'm going to end here by talking a little bit about Clausius, who was the other creator of the second law. Um, so Rudolf Clausius, uh, 1850, was kind of a freshly minted German physics PhD. His thesis was on an ingenious but ultimately incorrect theory of why the sky is blue. He also worked on elasticity theory and be working about thinking about molecules and their configurations and materials. But uh, by 1850, caloric theory had become very elaborate, and um, uh, you know, latent heat, free heat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Clausius' experience in elasticity theory made him quite skeptical. And knowing Mayer's and Joule's results, he decided to make a break with caloric theory and wrote his career launching paper. And this is the contemporaneous uh, translation of that paper on the moving force of heat and the laws regarding the nature of heat itself, which are deducible therefrom, by Rudolf Clausius. The steam engine having furnished us with a means of converting heat into emotive power, and our thoughts being thereby led to, a, to regard a certain quantity of heat as an equivalent to the amount of heat expended in its production, the idea of establishing theoretically some fixed relation between a quantity of heat and the quantity of work which it can possibly produce, from which relation conclusions regarding the nature of heat itself might be deduced, naturally presents itself. Already, indeed, have many instructive experiments been made with this view. I believe, however, that they have not exhausted the subject, but that, on the contrary, it merits the continued attention of physicists, partly because of the weighty objections lie partly because weighty objections lie in the way of the conclusions already drawn, 
and partly because other conclusions which might render efficient aid towards establishing and completing the theory of heat remain either uh, either entirely unnoticed or uh, have not as yet sufficiently found expression. The most important investigation in connection with the subject is that of S. Carnot. So there he is off and running. And um, he, uh, um, he talks about the ideal gas laws, the Carnot cycle, and um, uh, then he... Uh, um, this is a statement of the first law of thermodynamics that I have up on the screen here. And um, then he's, his paper is at least uh, is, is published in multiple installments, kind of building building um, uh, suspense. Maybe it's something I should do too. But um, in any case, he has a big, long thing. And that at some point in that whole document, he has the statement, hence by repeating both these alternating processes, Without the expenditure of force or other alteration, what whatever, any quantity of heat might be transferred from a cold body to a warm one, and this contradicts the general deportment of heat, which everywhere exhibits the tendency to annul differences of temperature and therefore to pass from a warmer body to a colder one. So that kind of embedded in this giant block of text is a statement of the second law of thermodynamics. And... um. When Kelvin quotes what Clausius has said, Kelvin quotes it as, it is impossible for a self-acting machine unaided by any external agency to convey heat from one body to another at a higher temperature. So Clausius has it in sort of embedded in this big block of text. Kelvin pulls it out and says it's really important. And, uh, and, and that's kind of the, um, and then goes on to these cosmic conclusions and so on. That's really the, the first appearance of the second law of thermodynamics. And um, it's, um, you know, in a sense, it's, it's, been, it's been couched in these rather uh, kind of um, technically sophisticated terms. It's all talking about um, heat engines and gases and so on. But in the end, it's the statement that mechanical work tends to uh, be turned by friction into heat and you don't go back. That there's this kind of one-way path from mechanical work to to heat, and it's sort of based on common experience. And this principle, which again was was formed and couched in these rather technical terms, is in the end a sort of everyday principle of what we observe in the world: this tendency of the dissipation of energy as heat. Um, but it's I think the technicalities kind of made it seem like a more definite and certain thing than if one had just made the statement, it seems like this is the case. The technicalities gave it an authority that made people say, yes, we can make this as a foundation on which we can have very cosmic conclusions. Um, but uh, and, and it was also confusing that Carnot uh, had had these arguments that were really of a very logical nature. They were most of Carnot's arguments were pure sort of logic from reversibility and so on, and didn't depend on kind of, for example, his assumptions about caloric theory and things like this. And the fact that those were sort of logical made it seem that that this idea of the second law of thermodynamics, which he'd entered as a kind of common sense principle, were also somehow of logical origin. So that's kind of the, the beginnings of this thing that has continued to today, where people routinely say, wasn't the second law of thermodynamics proved? Well, it wasn't until maybe now. But uh, I think we should we should stop there, and um, I I'm, I realize this history is a lot more elaborate than um, um, uh, um, uh, than the um, um, than than I had uh, well I had spent some time tracking down all of this history over some long period of time, but particularly recently, um, and I'm realizing it's going to take me a while to describe it all to. To you all, but uh, I, I hope you find it interesting. So, some of the things that we'll encounter here are, to me, kind of meta interesting in terms of the the progress of the history of science. Also, a little bit, they're matters of the times. Whether it's um, uh, you know Boyle's fleece of wool, whether it's Democritus's fire atoms, 
these are these are kind of descriptive mechanisms of their time, just as we'll talk later about computation as this strong descriptive mechanism of our time. These are it's interesting to see the reflection of these things from earlier times. It's also really interesting to me to see the way that, in a sense, scientific consensus gets formed. In the case of of the second law, this very quick jump to its cosmic consequences, um, and uh, uh, and we'll talk uh, another time about kind of the development of um, uh, the the sort of mathematicization of the second law, the work of uh, well uh, the introduction of entropy, the work of Boltzmann, um, work of Gibbs, uh, many people uh, contributing to the development of the second law really ends. The development really ends in the beginning of the 20th century. And after that, it's really textbookification that happens more than anything else. And there's uh, and we're kind of led to the point which the typical physicist would take today. Oh, hasn't the second law, wasn't the second law proved by Boltzmann in the late 1800s? We'll talk about why that isn't really the case and how we can do better in subsequent episodes here. Um, and... Uh, I think I should wrap up for now. Um, I'm afraid logistically this is a little bit complicated because uh, this week there'll be a lot of stuff about large language models, the the steam engines of their time. Um, and uh, so I'm not quite sure when we'll weave in subsequent episodes of, of talking about the history of the second law. Once I've talked about this history, I'm going to talk about uh, both my personal trajectory in studying the second law and then the things that I figured out recently about the second law and I think we can uh, take this 150-year story about the second law and where it comes from, why it's true, what its limitations are. I think we can end that story. I think we can say what's going on, what's really true, what the limitations are, things which, as I say, couldn't really have been discovered 150 years ago because the conceptual framework that is all around computation and the abstractions of computations just didn't exist at that time. All right, I should wrap up for now. So thanks very much and uh, bye for now.